Hello everybody and welcome to episode 8 of the Filmmaker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, we are joined here with um, uh, James Bush, uh, Hello again. interviewing again, and uh, Julian White down this way, and Martin Smith uh, as well. Welcome guys. How are you doing? Hi guys for coming on the show. Good evening, Good evening. Yeah. everyone. Thanks for, uh, for, thanks for giving us your time. Um, well, we won't we won't faff around. Uh, we might as well dig into some questions <laughs> because Let's dive straight in. Yeah, we'll dive straight in. We people can ask questions uh, in the comments section below, so please do. Um, but I'm going to sort of start it off with what made you become a DP. Uh, sorry, I'm see. I'm used to asking DPs now. <laughs> this is what I'm used to. What made you become a gaffer? A gaffer made me. A gaffer, yeah. And what was what the made process? Made not want to become DPs. <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. that. Uh, what, what made you want to become a gaffer? And, and what was the process for you in terms of becoming one? Like, how did you uh, get to the stage you are now? Uh, we'll start. We'll start with Martin. I could bore you all night with this one. Let me tell you. Okay. I mean. Um, what made me want to become a gaffer? I didn't really want to become a gaffer. I wanted to be a pilot. Um, uh, and I left school. I uh, didn't have the qualifications. Um, went to college to try and get the qualifications. That fell through. I got bored of college. Um, then my uncle gave me a job at an electrical firm uh, on the coast here. And uh, went to electrical college. Got my qualifications. Spent eight years as an electrician on many, many different jobs. And then uh, it was my girlfriend at the time, her dad, he was a gaffer, and he was going off to all these different locations around the world. And I said, look, you know, you, you claim you're an electrician, I'm an electrician, I work in building sites, and, and you go and work in Tahiti. So something's clearly wrong. Um, I want to become a, 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 an electrician at the time. You no, know, it wasn't yeah. gaffer. I wanted to become an electrician. So um i done my own research found some lighting companies and then went off to get interviews for different lighting companies and one was lee lighting one was afm lighting and the others was samuelson's um and i got the job at afm lighting oh. and it started there you know and off off i went working at the, at the electrical store there for two years and then taking out their equipment onto jobs, meeting people like Julian, who was working then as a gaffer. I remember working with Julian. I, I doubt he remembers it, but I did. No, I do. You brought the movie star out. Didn't you? That's exactly yeah. that. There's a funny story yeah. to that later, yeah, but I, I won't tell you yet. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I used to go out and um, take the equipment. Then I started working, taking their generators out, and then started to meet people like Julian and other gaffers. And I'll be in their ear nonstop, you know, come on, let me come out on your job. So I'm ready to come out. I'm an electrician. I've been doing it for 12 years by then, my electrical apprenticeship, and then two years at um, AFM. They were using us not only to maintain and service and, and repair all their equipment. They were using myself and another guy that um, came up with me, Greg Thomas. Um, they were using us to rewire their factory and, and do a lot of work, electrical work, cheap labor, really. Yeah. But it worked both ways. And then we went out and started meeting various different um, people. And it went from there. Got a job on a rigging crew, then onto a shooting crew. Met wonderful gaffers like Kevin Day, Eddie Knight, Dave Ridout, um, some commercials gaffers, Gary Owen and James Knight. I was very lucky, don't get me wrong, very, very lucky to meet the highest pedigree of, of professionals. And, um, and from that, started um, getting an eye for it and thought, you know, maybe I could be a gaffer one day and uh, maybe I could aspire to be like these guys. And, and that's how it really started. I got a taste for it. I quite like man management. It's always been one of my strengths. And that was taught to me by my uncle back in the early days of my electrical apprenticeship, how you deal with um, how you deal with crew and how you deal, deal with a team and how you look after them, how you've got to get their respect and also how... You need to control them, but in the in the, the nicest manner. And, and we can yeah. all be friends and still go to work together and get the best out of um, a team. And um, that's, you know, I saw maybe that there was a, a possibility that one day I could be a leader of a, an electrical team. And, uh, and that's what I aimed for. And once I had that in my sights, you know, there was nothing really going to stop me um, going for it. So that's the short version of it. Yeah. That's the very we, short we don't, version. I don't think we've got time for the long version, but... No. Yeah, that's... I don't think you have. You're the willpower. <laughs> but yeah, so... And I would say, to, 
one say credit to Martin. He's very good at leading people, actually, and I've always admired him for that. He's very. He's got a really good team. And they're, they're acting like a family, and that's a credit to him, actually. I've worked very kind. Thank said. you. No, Martin. no, it's genuine. I, I really do because you know I work with Greg and different people, and I'm always like, how does he do it? He's always got. You've always got this very relaxed attitude about people, and I think it's very nice. I get a bit stressed out, unfortunately, but I grew up with three older brothers, and I think that's always my problem. <laughs> I'm always trying to compete with. I don't know. Anyway, but I've got better at it. So Martin, you, sure you went you... up through the the ranks, as it were, and and Julian, I saw. Well, I'm guessing, did you do similar? Or from IMDb, I'm, I just saw that you were kind of you did sort of shorts and then smaller features yeah, and then just I, gaffer I would, straight away. It's funny, Martin said it. You know, you know, I don't think people actually look to be a gaffer. I don't think you come out of school and go, I want to be a gaffer because not, most lot of people don't know what it is. I did some early work in the film industry, but I didn't enjoy it particularly. I was doing some props and location management, but I just needed some money and. I, I actually went to art college and studied painting. And then when I left art college, I got into doing some lighting and stage design in a local place. Uh, you know, quite big bands, but they just sort of turn up and go, what are we doing? And we just designed a stage. And I learned by working and doing it. And I quite enjoyed it. But it wasn't well paid at the time. And then I left and moved back to it. Left, moved to Spain for three or four years, came back. And then I met people in the film industry who I'd met through other people. And this one guy said to me, you know, we're doing a film, we're looking for uh, electricians. I've been doing some lighting for different projects and things like that, but not in a professional way, more like a, not amateur in the sense of that it wasn't organized, but it was just not for money. And uh, it was more for the passion of it. And, you know, I wanted to make a bit of money and wanted to become more professional. I was around in my late 20s. And this guy said, do you want to work on a film as a spark for five weeks for no money? And I was like, not really, no. <laughs> but then I thought, well, actually you know why not and then something hooked me a little bit and it wasn't a great project it wasn't a great film but the best boy said you know you're really good what have you done and i said this is my first job and i never because i didn't want i didn't look you know i think sometimes if you're looking for something you it's hard to you know you've got too much anticipation whereas i didn't have an anticipation to do it so anyway then my name got passed to pat McAnally at lee lighting it was a great influence on me and a great help action he passed well then there was a time when uh Band of Brothers were looking for extra labour, so I went out and I stayed for five weeks on that. And I met Jimmy Wilson and Laurie Shane, who, who actually became great influences on me, certainly Jimmy, because I got to know him better than Laurie. And Laurie sadly passed away. But Jimmy was always a very positive, cheery, happy person, very well organised, great crew, and it was a really good experience. And then I got on to Sleepy Hollow with Biggles for like five nights. And I was just like, wow, I didn't know that this existed, really. I knew there was filmmaking, I knew that I loved films, but I didn't. I'd never been on a big set like that, and it really was quite, it was like a, a military exercise, and it was interesting what Martin was saying about, you know, that man management is a big part of our job, yeah. and I never took that very well, I was always like, so then I did uh, lower budget, smaller things, and built my way up through that, and I enjoyed it, and then, you know, you just go on, and on, and it, you know, you meet different people, and you, if you've got a good attitude, you can go a long way, but my real thing is not technology, it's lighting, I love lighting, I'm very much influenced by light itself rather than the technology. It's not my forte, and I readily admit, admit that. But it's the, the thing that really ga captures me is the, you know, the, the lighting of scene. It really is something I enjoy. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it was a similar route. As I said, I don't, you know, the only way of being a gaffer is by being a gaffer. And it's a very difficult, you don't go to, you know, a job gaffer school thing and they go, what do you want to do? You want to be a gaffer? Like, I, don't, yeah. I have no idea what it is, you know, so. Um, yeah. So, so it's an interesting pro leads on, sorry. I was gonna say it leads on to another question here, exactly like what then what type of gaffer would you say you are uh, and like what, what do you bring to the productions when you're brought onto a team well because uh, I, 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 I had a, sorry uh, yeah because I, I think because I had a fine art background I'd much more get the the final pro the final image I sort of work backwards if you know what I mean I know what I'm looking at and looking for and what they're looking for but I have to sort of uh, retrofit it in a way and I learned that by working with different people like Biggles and, you know, um, Laurie and Jimmy and going on other people's sets. And then you sort of piece it together, a big puzzle. And because I uh, I think I'm quite good at seeing the bigger picture, quite literally, of looking at it from a distance, from an objective point of view. And it's a bit like you play the orchestra rather than, than you're the violinist or the oboe player or whatever. You're the conductor. And that's what I, a bit like Martin was saying about man management is that that's what you have to do is step back and see the whole thing. And that's quite a big ask sometimes on a big film you have to really hold your metal you know and, and and look over things and beyond things and not get too involved with the personalities and the egos and all that stuff so i was very much a broad strokes i guess would be a thing and then i do the detail 
and I and I actually like the thing of being on set and having the the moment where you know something you just it's something twigs in your head and you can see through all the other stuff and you just go oh that's where it all becomes nice it makes good you know it's a, it becomes where the job is really the icing on the cake quite literally yeah and and yourself then Martin similar question I think very similar to Julian but maybe we got there in different different yeah, journeys um i'd like to think i'm um a very much a team player very much uh, budget conscious very much um very conscientious of uh, the crew and and the other departments i like to think i'm very suggestive very open to um suggesting lighting options to a dp uh, very creative um i think you know Ultimately, I'm I'm somebody that's there to to support the production in in many different ways. My job as a gaffer is is well, without doubt, over the last five years has changed so much with the new technology that's come in. I guess I'm also you know a student of being a gaffer because our technology just to keep up with it, we have to you know there's so many different lights out there now and the technology we've gone from film to digital and now we've gone from tungsten to hmi to to fluorescent and now into um led technology i think i'm still learning to be quite honest with you i think um you know and i would imagine julian is trying to keep up with technologies but overall i think my role as a gaffer is there to really put the director and the DP's vision on, onto the, you know, onto the film or onto the chip nowadays and to help create that. And, and whether I get from some DP's total input or from others, they, they, you know, they just want to know that the lights are going to be there on the day and can be adjusted and to be efficient and, and, and very, you know, very um, just, just great sort of skills helping the whole production team, mold the final product i think um there's there's just different types of gaffer or different same types of gaffer but on different jobs your role has to adapt quite a lot and um some guys just want to use a bit of tungsten light others want every little bit of technical um you know the latest technical equipment that's been released from the latest bsc show you know it it, it really varies but ultimately i'm there to support the whole production crew the whole you know, electrical crew and, and each and every department and to try and do that to best of my ability and bring it in on budget. I don't know whether that's everything a gaffer should be, but that's kind of where I sit, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's Absolutely low. Responsibility. Uh, it came up to me is that when I, when I, I sort of take on the whole budget of the film, and not literally, but I kind of go, well, we're part of that. We're as a section of that film. We, if we don't do our job, then the whole film suffers. So we have to see it that as a complete unit. And then be part of the, you know, that part of the machine that works. And if we don't work properly, then what's the point of anybody else doing it? You know, so it's it is a great responsibility, and you have to look at it as a budgetary thing. To a point. Obviously. Yeah, I did. I did like your point, Martin, about um, you know that we're constantly learning because I mean I think that without doubt that's that's one doubt. of the favorite, like most favorite things for me about doing, being a DP. Like I'm just everything every movie I watch, I'm like oh wow, you know, I just noticed something there. You know, and you, every, exactly that. every day I'm on set, you know, I'm learning something new and I'm only ever learning through, you know, filming. So I think that's, that's a really good point. Equally, you know, myself and Julian, we get to work with so many DPs, so many different, you know, skills and abilities and people paint with light in different ways. And we get to see the way they want to do that and their vision. We get to put all that into practice. And sometimes that can be very simply put, you know, and very, very beautiful, but other times it can be so complicated that the end result can be equally as good. A lot Absolutely. of the times, it you know, it can be a, a, a right old mess, really. And um, depending on how much trust you've got within yourself and the DP's relationship, you can almost adjust that and point them in a better direction. And, and you know, I feel that's quite a big role of a gaffer to try and help steer the DP into you know, so maybe some of the tricks you've tried in the past with some of the yeah, other DPs. Let's all share the information. Let's try and get better looking movies and, and TV yeah. shows. Let's not try and just crash bang wallop and, and, and you know, end up with uh, pretty poor pictures, especially like the, the coming out at the moment. Now we're yeah. quite clearly seeing commercials being made on the, 
with limited crew and limited, you know, talent. Yeah. So you know, I think, yes, working with all these different DPs helps the gaffer immensely to see so many different types of styles. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Um, That's really good. What um, what inspires uh, who and what inspires and influences your way of working, Julian? Um, you know what you kind of pick- what kind of drives you? Uh, what I guess. Um, yeah, what, are there any like you know famous DPs or past people well, or I art guess, or something you that know, drives you? You grow into? up, you grow up watching films and uh, paintings and things like that. you know we've got this image everywhere, and you kind of get. I think it's a bit like food, is you you get to like certain things and you don't like other things, and therefore, you know, you have a certain hunger for things that you just want to. You know, and partly you're paid for it, but also that there's a passion about, you know, doing. Uh, no, really, it's not. It's not an individual thing that influences me, or it's just it's an unknown thing. I think it's like walking past something and you go, oh, "I'd really love to take a photograph of that," and you stop and take a photograph of it. When you're getting paid for it and you're doing that as a, you know, and involved with all the other things that you have to do during the day, like people and pro- uh, equipment and budgets and all that, it it can dull it. So it's just keeping that nugget really that. Um, that you go, oh, that you know. There's film moments where you go, wow, that was really quite amazing, and it's and then when you see it on the uh, as a finished product, it's even more so. But it's kind of a, it's a it's um I guess it's an intuitive thing. I think for me, it's when I get a script, you start reading it and you start imagining it and you start you know expanding in your mind. It doesn't always come out as you expect, obviously, but mm. that's what it, that hooks you in. Originally, and then of course there's the, the actors and the locations and all those things you know it's but it's an unknown journey and you're just starting out but you've obviously got a, a some kind of a map to it and you have to try and plan that out yeah um but i i always get very you know i'm i'm sad actually that the film industry not as much as the money and the going to work is just that the variation in your life that happens you know the things mm. that you go wow i'm going to do this or do that or meet that or you know we're going to we're going to construct something out of nothing and that's quite interesting actually as a mental and physical project you know yes yeah, it's, it's creating um, something from nothing which is always i think the most exciting yeah it's in the, it's in the, it's all an illusion and that's the problem is it's called burst at the moment we're kind of going oh but we want it to come back and obviously you know you you do these interesting things you travel the world and see all these interesting things and you create things and then it all just disappears and you shut the studio door and you go home mm-hmm. and then one day it comes out and you it, hopefully it's good and you can remember it and keep it you know but it's kind of that journey is very long and it's very hard to keep hold of that vision through that mm. i think that um my problem i was what martin's saying actually is sometimes dops don't really want you to influence you don't have they want don't want you to have an input and that breaks my heart in a way right because yeah. you just think well actually you just want somebody to put up lights and i think that's it it's kind of i get it but also it's like we're a team you know and they're seen as the right hand men so if you want somebody to put up lights then you should just get somebody to put up lights not a gaffer because yeah. a gaffer is a, a you know partly creative partly management and partly technical and it's you know that we all fight on different we have our different strengths i guess and some people are better techni- te- with technology and other people are better with uh, intuitive uh, dramatic lighting i guess it's uh, for sure yeah it's yeah. an interesting process for sure what well, um martin likewise for you like what what do you find i guess um what drives you to do what you do and is it what kind of money things inspire, purely money what kind of things Nothing inspire else. you <laughs> cash um it's the creative journey that you go on but i get to go on it with my some of my best friends i mean it's it's quite a unique job i've worked in the most terrible conditions on building sites in the rain and you know i've been frozen to my core on building sites fixing conduits and track you know when you go you go on a film set you work with your friends you get fed well but the creative input that normally you get on a movie it's it's just fantastic to be part of that and, and to be yeah. part of a team of really highly skilled, you know, in, in our departments at least, and, and, and I can't speak for everyone's department, but the team that you build around you and the trust that you've got and the rela- relationships and the abilities they all have, you can go to work and you can smile through the toughest of days. You can really keep morale up and, 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 and be that key kingpin that, just keeps the energy it's the energy on a film you know because you can have some really grotty days on films and everyone has to dig deep and it's those moments almost when it's going wrong and you're digging deep and and you've got a lot of situations and um you know it's a little bit out of your control it's the way that the team you've built around you come together to solve those problems 
unlike any other industry I've worked in, I've worked in some different areas and, you know, you don't get that anywhere else. Maybe in the military, I would imagine it's a similar kind of style of work. You've got somebody leading the charge, but ultimately it's the people around you that are, are making it all work. And I think yeah. that really, for me, that is the drive that keeps me going, just being part and having the, the opportunity to be part of something as big as making a, you know, 200 million pound movie. I mean, how, how many people get to do that? I drive to work and pinch myself. Mm. You know, I get up, I get yeah. up ridiculously early, half four in the morning. I drive to London. I, I get up there for, you know, 6 a.m. And I, I start the day early and then return home late. There's something in it to keep me doing that. Otherwise, what crazy person would do that every day, day in, day out, you know, throughout the winter? With yeah, the it's a very thrilling nights. ride, it's, actually, it's, isn't it? It's kind of... It's just that emotional ride that um, we're all lucky enough to be part of. And some of the experiences, some of the places, some of the places I've been and the people I've been with, and, you know, they're pinch yourself once in a lifetime moments that nobody else in the world is ever going to have that that moment, that experience, that moment of time when you're, you know, with all these creative people and you've come to that pinnacle point and it's all working out. It's a pinch yourself moment. And then to go and watch a movie that you've been part of and heavily on a movie, a gaffer and the team, without doubt, are one of the biggest, largest and most important parts of any movie. And any movie needs a team. Don't get me wrong, but the part you play in that and the amount of departments that you help being a gaffer, you know, you're there to help so many and service so many different departments with different aspects and different bits of equipment and advice and knowledge. And equally, then they repay you to be part of that has always grabbed me. And, and, and you know, it, it the minute I worked on my first movie, I, it sort of grabbed my heart you were and, sold. Um, and took me with it. And it's, you know, hopefully it will take me a little bit further. I'm not so sure at the moment, but um, let's see what happens. Yeah, let's we'll see. see how things carry on, hopefully, yeah. at some point. Yeah. So, so then uh, who brings you on to a project then? Is it like, does the DOP request you or do the producers bring you in beforehand? Or it's, it's a little bit, varies a little bit, you know, from my point of view at least. A lot of the time, it's the director of photography um, whom you've either worked with before or he's worked with somebody that you've worked with or you've been recommended or, you know, a producer, maybe a producer or even a production manager might phone you up and say, you know, we've got this DP coming in from the States. Um, she or he's looking for a gaffer. How do you feel about maybe interviewing? There's different ways in, mainly DPs and um, people you've worked with recommend you but equally you know i've found now recently production managers are fantastic even you know producers phoning you up now saying look this guy's coming into town or another gaffer sometimes will bring you up and say i've i work with this guy you know maybe you could look after him I, i've or her I've got, I've got nobody i've got another job i've got nobody in in mind and the, the gaffer uh, the dp's got nobody in mind maybe you can cover maybe you can go and do the movie for me. You know, that's, that's three ways that I can there's think always, of. I there's mean, there's always a way. Yeah. There, there's different ways. I don't know if Julian's got any more ways, but there's, you know, it does. <laughs> if he yeah, has, let me know. <laughs> that covers it, really. Yeah, I guess thing, there's. Always, you know, you're always going on your, not a reputation, but it's like every day is, is uh, uh, you know, you could meet somebody that could change the next day. And it's, that's the important thing is to keep it, don't get bored by it and don't let it. Um, you know, weigh you down, so you just see it. You know, when I first started, I saw a lot of older guys who were just, you know, like husks of their former self, grumpy and fed up. And I was like, I don't want to become like that. And if no. yeah. if that's going to work, I'm I'm not having it. You know. Yeah. I think no. And, uh, I think I think that you should be optimistic and positive and and share. I like might said share share it. You know, share the ideas and share the thoughts and share the love a little bit and be, you know, be a, a team player in the bigger spirit of that. You know. Mm. And I think that attracts it attracts people as well. Imagine how exciting it is to get a call from a production manager or a DP saying, you know, do you want to come and do this movie with me? Yeah. Imagine how you feel. Cause you know, it is quite a special moment knowing that you're about to probably employ up to 200 people in your department over the course of the movie and the excitement that creates knowing and working out who's going to be where and who's going yep. to be in the team. Yep. And Absolutely. you're desperate then to start spreading the news and pick up the phone and see if your team are about or what they've been up to. You know, we all, we all know where they are and what they're up to and they kind of know what we're up to, but it's that spark that happens 
the minute you know you, you've got a little hook little there, and yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a buzz, it's something about it. I, that's the part I really enjoy, the spark of the movie just before it really gets going. And, and the, the planning that goes on before a movie, you've even been paid a penny, the stuff yes. that goes on in your head, the yeah, calls yeah, you make, exactly. the research you do, that's the, that's the part, that's the bit, really. You know, that's, that's where it creates the, the energy, and the energy starts doesn't stop till the day you rap you know it really doesn't but um that's where it all starts i i, I find that quite fascinating mm. there's uh ozzy morris was a i think it's ozzy morris yeah he was a gaffer and he worked with freddie francis and he said that we'd always get a call back in the 70s and 60s i guess and freddie would be like where and he go where are we going and he'd be like you know going to south, Arabia or south america he goes oh great we're off on the flying carpet and it was that's what he took it as you know and it was a great adventure and it was yeah. fabulous you know and that's i hooked that hooked in me a lot it was like oh great you know i traveled all since I was a little kid and I that thing of like unknown destinations is quite fascinating and it can be somewhere really banal but you never know and it's quite, it's fascinating and I think and, you're and quite right yeah. yeah I think you're now. going on an adventure busy. Julian you you hit yeah, it on the, the so. nail on the head you're all going on an adventure and how many people get to do that for a living yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and get paid for it yeah, yeah. yeah. um what yeah. no it's fabulous I, I you know what would you guys say um I mean, you, you've already mentioned this, that you're, you're probably one of the hardest working sort of crew members and departments. I'm sure, sure other departments sure have other other words to say about that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you're no, one of the toughest, tough. hardest working. Let's be honest, um, this is true. Yeah, but what? It's, a full on, it's, a, it's a full on thing. You can't retire from, you know, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to go and sit in a trailer for an hour and yeah. do some something yeah. else you don't have paperwork you're on set all the time yeah you're yeah. having to deal with people coming in going oh you know those 58 sky panels you want to put up yeah. you want to go this way or that way you know you have to you yeah. have to have your brain is completely full all the time plus dealing with all the other stuff that you have to deal with well, egos other than the like, budget stuff a, i mean not a, it's I know, not a ride for the faint heart i know that's always a pain. the budget stuff even for myself you know i don't <clears throat> on smaller projects you know i have to budget things as well but um, yeah, of course. in terms of uh, in terms of well, let's let's talk about the the toughest day on set, shall we? What's been um, not so much the toughest day in terms of weather and things like that, but what's the most difficult sort of thing you had to light that was um, involved? Well, it can, it can be something small, it can be something big, but I want to know what the toughest sort of challenge lighting you've had. Uh, and June, what's that? Well, I guess on the big stuff would be something like Cinderella, but you have months of planning, so sure. that's not so. It's a challenge, but in a different way. The other, the other ones is when people like Ridley Scott did on The Martian did something, and he goes, "Oh," and you we're already shooting the scene. He'd go, "Oh, I want him to go up and press that button." It goes red, green, and then does that, and you go, "Okay." Well, there's two things there. There's no button there. We have to, we have to, you know. So I'm like, uh, we've got, we've got the art director, and they're already, you know. Again, we're turning. It's not like uh, this is tomorrow. Yeah. And Ridley's Ridley's a nice man, but he's also not going to wait around. So he's like, "Can you yeah. do that?" And you go, and you have to go, well, "Yeah, yes or no." And you go, "Yeah." And then, so you go, "Get me the practical guy." He comes in, get the art director in. Uh, Can you do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go, "Okay." And then we got to wire it in. Then we got to get back to a Wi-Fi link and all that. Meanwhile, you know, time's ticking, and Ridley's a bit like, "How long's it going to be?" And you go, ten minutes." And that's a call you have to go, and it's not a big thing. Let's face it, but it's it's the it's a close up of a guy pushing a button, so you have to create it somehow, or say, yeah, I can't do it. And I think that's the difficult thing. And it's not an uh, that's not the only one, but there's so many times where you have to just kind of think, can I do it? You have to maybe hold, bite your lip a little bit, or you know, you know, uh, cross your fingers and say, yes, I can do it, and then organize <laughs> that it very quickly. And it's really that can be very exciting and thrilling, and you let out a huge sigh of relief. But you have to take the plunge if you want to go forward. I think you can't just go, no, I can't do it, because yeah. otherwise you've not tried. And if he, somebody would rather see you fail by but try than not bother. And I think you know other, other times it's just making a call where you go, I think you should do that, and they're like, really? And I go, yes, you should. And they go, why? And you have to project forward by three months why you think that should happen, and everybody's like, you're crazy. And then eventually you get to there and you go, and they're like, oh, that was a good idea. And you go, yeah. But you can also go the other way where it's like, well, that was a waste of time. You're like, well, I didn't know. And But you have to, that's 20 years, 15 years, 10 years of experience. Anybody can call themselves a gaffer, but the only way of learning it is by doing it. And the only way, you know, you have to just every day step forward a little bit and be prepared to fail and, and go forward. And it's, you know, the, the, the bigger setups like Cinderella, the ballroom scene is huge, but you've also had months of planning and you've got, you know, 
5,000 channels of dimming and all that stuff. And if something goes wrong, it's a longer, bigger machine. So you can have, it's a slower moving thing. Whereas the fast moving things are quite difficult because you have to think very fast on your feet and make a call, which is very difficult. Yeah. And be held to it as well. Yeah. I guess you always have to be held account, uh, accountable with you know, if you yeah. make the bet or not. Um, and if you see it forward, you know, you have to be held accountable. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I learn, like Martin said, I think we learn from other people's experience all the time. And I watch other people on set, other heads of department, how they deal with directors, for instance, or cameramen or whatever producers and i go and they go yeah mate it'll be five minutes and i'm like don't say that because yeah. you, you're only hurt, you're only you might as well put a gun to your head because yeah. they will hold you to that that's, and say, you that's said the five DP. minutes yeah. yeah that's the dp's or, minute director. <laughs> exactly yeah. and, and it should be forbidden you have to be very not accurate because you can't be but you have to surmise that a five minute you know it's just and and people like ridley just don't take it they're like i've been doing this for 50 years i know it's not gonna be five minutes so you you make me you, it feels like you're insulting my intelligence and you have to yeah. be quite mm. cool with that and be like, and also process all that all the time and see problems arriving before they happen. It's quite difficult as well. So. Yeah. Uh, Martin, what, what's been your toughest sort of lighting setup you've had to do? Uh, or challenges? Well, we've had many, you know, we've had many tough challenges, but um, I think some of the smaller movies are indeed the toughest. We just shot, um, a film called The Witches, remake of The Witches. Yeah. And not only were we limited on budget, but, um, you know, we, we really had to put a lot of planning into the sets. So the sets, we couldn't afford to build, you know, 10 or 20 different sets across five or six stages. We had two stages, and in those stages, there was up to, I think it was up to about six or seven sets, quite large sets, all on top of each other. Not only that, those sets had to be remodeled maybe once, um, sometimes, uh, sorry, twice or three times. So the planning that had to go into those before, um, you know, the cables, the different distribution, the network, um, the control for the lighting. But then the rigs that had to go in, we had to rig for set three, pull it up in the air, rig for set two, pull it up in the air, then have set one rigged ready for a remodel because you'd only have up to 24 hours to remodel the set. Sometimes you'd have a bit longer. Um, and everything all had to be into place. It was almost like a, you know, like a, a giant Jenga set where everything, if you pulled the wrong thing out, it could all come tumbling down around you. Um, and every, every piece of that set had to be controlled, um, you know, back to the light and desk. Um, and you'd have, You'd have multiple lights, soft boxes, hard light around the perimeters with also soft lights and some automated moving lights for each set. And once that set was finished, the walls came down or got revamped. You'd then drop that rig and bring in rig two, uh, which would be ready and have to be ready and planned. We'd have to light blue screens that got moved around. So we'd have to have fluorescent type lighting in position. Um, it was it was a real head pickle. And myself and the, the desk op and the, the rigging gaffer had to sit down and, and the rigger, of course, as well. We all had to sit down and look at these drawings, you know, many, many times and, and mark on the set design and where the lights could possibly be and how then that would interlink. And you could also use some of the existing cabling and the data and the networking and how to almost simplify that so that then when we do a, a main swing to one set, the other you know, they didn't have, you know, millions of pounds. We had, I think it was a 50 million pound budget. Um, the director was Bob Zemeckis, Robert Zemeckis. And um, we, we, we had to, you know, he gave us so much information. We had a script. He gave us all the information and we had to be ready for every, you know, little detail that was needed. And um, it was just, it was, and, and, and indeed the labor, we had a very limited um, budget for, for crew and plant and machinery and so we had to be wise we really had to put our thinking caps on and break it down into the the most achievable kind of simplistic sets uh, or lighting uh, rigs so that then they could be adapted at speed and it was very complicated you know so but for you know, all these, we were, for all these with a great team around us we we, we sort of managed it I, you know i still am quite proud that movie hasn't been released yet i'm extremely proud of the look of that movie and um, indeed 
you know, how we, we sort of achieved it with a, with a lower budget. So with something like that, I mean, you were saying like you'd have, you'd, I mean, the planning, like you said, must, was, was really complicated because you've got net one set, another yeah. set, another set, and then you use them and you go through the stack a bit like Tetris. You know. It was amazing. Um, it was absolutely, you know, the how, DP, how did Don the DP had to work was, that out? It's very specific on how he wanted the lighting to look. Right. Um, he had so much trust. You know, I think he used to walk in on set and think these they're never going to actually achieve this. You could tell by the look on his face. He used to tell, I saw him tell other departments to just clear off the set, the sparks need it, <laughs> otherwise we're yeah. never going to get these lights in. And, yeah. you know, we did achieve it, and you sometimes get close to the mark. I'm not saying it was perfect everywhere because it, you know, it wasn't, but it, it, some areas um, were a little rougher than others. But it, it, all in all, it was a damn safe, first safe and, and, and very tidy you know well-planned rig and i think that was our hardest challenge was, i have to say something like that did the did don did he have to did, did he know exactly what, how he was going to light actors in different positions and have to plan to that or just do a general lighting no we had a pretty uh, broad hard. stroke lighting um package you know we had uh, perimeter lighting sky panels above all the set walls it's pretty standard soft box in the middle it's hard lights rigged around the soft box and then some harder lights rigged around the perimeters, all on electric hoist. You can drop them in and out, spin the sky panels round, hook on a bigger sky panel if you want, diffuse it, rig some frames. But it was all automated. It was all very nicely done. The set designer, Gary Freeman, was a great help. He, he built the sets to help with the lighting, which, you know, if you've got a production designer that you've got a good relationship with and that's going to help you, you know, work uh, with the set designs, then you're halfway there. Yeah, um, Don didn't really, um, Don knows how to light the actors. Of course he does. I mean, he's world class, but we didn't know where the actors were going to be no, at that yeah. time. So we, it was the broad strokes and then it's how you fine tune that Would um, you then put stands, lighting. Stands on the floor yeah. or things like that for, you know, key lights or things like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. For the beauty, when you're yeah. in close, you, you, you know, you have to, you have to bring that in and you have to diffuse it and you have to model it and shape it a lot more. But, you know, for the wider shots and they want to see the whole set was a stunning set or many different sets. They want to see it. So that's where the, the broader strokes come in and the practical element heavily um, practically lit as well. Um, that, that also is a, a, a huge help when you're lighting these scenes and it gives it detail and it gives it uh, depth and it gives it shape and, um, all that planning went into such a tight little time scale of, I think it was only a, maybe a six or an eight week prep. Um, maybe it was only a six week rig. And I think there was about seven or eight sets in our first stage, wow. then got completely remodeled into probably six or seven more. And uh, there was another stage that was a huge hotel that got revamped in many different ways. It was, it was great, but um, you know, it, it was tough. It was a, re you know, you're up late at night drawing and, and making phone calls to the rigging gaffer and you're trying to figure out the best ways and then the rigger will come in and you'll figure out how that will work within the, the motorized truss and the hoists and the cabling and the distribution. Then the desk op has to have his input of how the network's going to provide um, enough channels for all these different lights and, and practicals. I don't know. Sometimes, you know, that's where you build the team and that's where it comes together they're the moments where, you know, you are quite proud of yourselves <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for actually achieving it. I think, um, yeah, I think that was probably our toughest gig. Um, not physically, but definitely mentally. Yeah. yeah. So then um, would you say you prefer working on bigger budget movies or do you like getting stuck into those indie smaller films? Well, I mean, it wasn't really an indie small film. It was 50 million no. budget, I, yeah. I guess. <laughs> I guess I don't um, really. I, I, do you know what I like is when the phone rings and someone says, will you come and work with me? I, mm. I find that as a massive privilege that I don't know how I've got to that position. It's through hard work, blood, sweat and tears. But when that phone rings and someone says, do you want to come and do a movie? Then the answer, apart from a couple of DPs who I won't mention that I'm not really keen on <laughs> you know, ever working with, but they're out there and probably vice versa to them but the answer is normally a great big yes let's right. let's do it you know let's do it and let's try and make if it's a 200 million pound budget or a 30 million pound budget you've got to you've got to make it work you've got to make yeah. you've got to capture the director director's vision you've got to paint the light how the dp wants it but you've 
you've got to make it fit into the budget. Otherwise, you're as good as gone, really. You know, producers and production managers don't want the guy that's overspending left, right and centre. Um, and indeed, you, you, you know, you're not really achieving your job if you're doing that. So it's quite important for me to try at least to stick within the budgets. And, and if we can't afford it, you've got to put your hands up and say, we really can't afford this. We're going to have to find a, a simpler and, and cheaper option. And, and they are out there. There's always different ways and many different ways of lighting sets. So if you can do that and be part of that, then, you know, you, you'll hopefully get called back for the next movie. That's yeah. the way I see it. Yeah. Yeah. I think also yes. that the, the both things yeah. inform each other. So when you go on a lower budget indie film, you know, even if it's 20, 30 million, you learn things and do things. But you, you're challenged in different ways. It's, you know, it's maybe a, it's not a bigger vehicle. It's certainly more sprightly and you have to be, you know, I think equally as far as in Martin's right, that all the laws still exist. You know, you still have to come within budget and, and, uh, and create the vision that has been put towards you. And it's, but it's kind of, I think, it's quite good to keep it keeps you fresh by doing mixing it up a little bit. It never hurts. <laughs> yeah. sure. But obviously you work longer hours probably in doing, you know, a lot more moving in locations and things like that. It's 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 more strenuous. They're compressing a lot more uh, uh, stuff into a smaller space. Uh, talking of small spaces, I I, yeah. I see you 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 have a credit doing uh, being the gaffer and lock, which just takes place in a car. Is that right? Yeah, actually, you know, after the challenge question, I, I that was one that was always, but it was only shot over five days, so yeah. it was kind of. The challenge was not freezing our backsides off on a low loader for five nights. <laughs> but uh, and also just trying to keep I think Harris did a great job. He just kept it interesting and moving. You know, Tom, it's Tom's one of Tom's best roles, actually. And I think it's it's not a thriller, but it's certainly an interesting piece of work. And it, it looks good. Uh, it was greater than the sum of its parts. I mean, we did there was, you know, me and a desktop and even they weren't there. Chris Craig wasn't even there all the time. He just set me up. We left, uh, you know, midnight uh, uh, sundown, and we didn't come back till four in the morning. And we did the script twice or three times a night, and we just had two cameras. Month, which we kept... No, it was shot on the A13. We weren't allowed on ah. the motorway, the low loader. Originally, ah. we wanted to do the the actual travel. I think it was from Birmingham to London once a night, and we'd just do that whole route. But they wouldn't allow us, so we did the A13 classic A13 loop, which I'm sure we've all done low loaders before. Yeah. And uh, but it was good, and we had a uh, you know police vehicles to follow us around, which we used and. It was it was actually coming out. You were you know exhausted. You did five nights. It was freezing cold, and I had just we had uh, rigged lights and a dimmer board, and I just would operate it live as it were with no plan, listening to Tom's performance at the same time. And it, and actually I, when I we finished it, I was like I don't know what that's going to come out like. I had no plan, no real clue how it would work. And and again, I think it's very cinematic. It's quite intriguing film, and it's um, it was hard to work on, but in a, in a different way of having just to be. We had no money at all. I mean, it was a very small. I think it was two million for the whole thing. Yeah, and it did very well. And 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 I think as, yeah. uh, was it was was a good challenge. Well done, if you know what I mean. It was kind of yeah. a, it was a, an interesting thing. I, and it proves actually, if you if you know with what's going on now, you could actually shoot something like that. That's true. Not every film's going to yeah. be set in a BMW. Yeah, <laughs> but you yeah. can work your way around things. But it's not going to employ that many people. It's simple. No, no. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. Um, I'm available if you get that one again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit on the low low. It's fine. It's funny. There was a film called Buried came out years ago, which uh, yeah. uh, Edu Grau shot, and it's a old guy shot. Uh, he's trapped in a coffin or something, isn't he? That's right. Yeah. yeah. But there was like six sparks on it, and I could never work out what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's all lit by a mobile phone. It, it wasn't. It was a joke, but it was kind of it's ironic. Yeah, absolutely. Can't say I was going to say. No, no, yeah, James. I do that. Yeah, another one here then. So what then sort of grabs your attention when you uh, go on to a particular project? Is it like the script or the director of the DOP or, or as you said earlier, Martin, is just getting off for the job, which is also great? Yeah, exactly that. I mean, there's many different things that are going to grab your attention when you when, when once you get the call, at least. I think, um, you know, it's it's sometimes the initial meeting with the DOP that sets the tone, you know, I've sat with many DOPs I've never worked with before. And you have that initial conversation and it's them trying to tell you how the tone of the movie is going to be and the, the style. And it's you trying to fight your corner a little bit at that time to try and help steer them into not doing something crazy. And uh, it's finding that balance, trying to protect them from the start. If you've worked with a director before, which I've done a few times and the DP hasn't, it's trying to explain 
how possibly there's better ways of working and how the director likes to work. Maybe they choose not to listen. Some do, some don't. And it's then just finding that kind of first foothold on on how you, you're going to have a, a working relationship and how you're going to build on that and, and develop some trust. Because at first, you don't know each other. You know, you really don't. And um, I, I, I kind of find that quite a fascinating part of the dance really early on. I think yeah, it's um, in his dance as well. You're right. It is, it is. And, you know, you're trying to fight a little bit, but you're not ever anyone who sits there and is going to say no to everything. You might as well get your coat and go. I mean, you're yeah, trying no. to take all that information in, not fight your corner, but at least put your stall out and say, well, you know, there are possibly better ways of doing this with this director. I have been through this before and I mm. will try and protect you, but I could suggest maybe this, that and the other. And, um, it's trying to get that little bit of balance early on and a little bit of a jostle and um, hopefully then you both set off on the right foot and then the journey begins. It's it's not a simple one, but um, it is a journey and it's an adventurous journey that uh, I think clearly Julian enjoys and I enjoy. And um, and that's, the, that's, like I say, that's the spark of the movie. You know, that's where it really gets going. So hmm. I don't know if even that answered the question, but it felt quite nice, that one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Julian, you saw that earlier. Down a memory lane. About yeah, the script. Yeah. I, I get a hunch about a film. I go, yeah. there's something about that. I don't know what it is. You know, I don't chase films particularly. I'm not one of those to be calling people going, oh, I already want to do it. Partly because I don't think I'm that good and I just want things to come to me. But I kind of, I get a hunch. Sometimes I go, you know what? There's something about that. And it, I'm not saying it's always proven right, but I think your instinct, because on paper, certain things, you go, oh, you're going to go here and there. And then actually you just go, ah, it ain't going to happen the way I thought it was. And you're di- disappointed by it. So if you're not, you know, there's a kind of a thing. It's it's, it's the adventure. It's like, hey, do you want to, do you fancy going? And you go, you know what? I actually do. You know, one film, I just finished um, uh, Murder on the Orient Express and we were in Malta and I literally got an email and I looked at my phone and just went, well, that's spam. You know, I thought it was junk mail, so I deleted it. And then I reread it, and it was somebody saying, oh, we're looking for a gaffer to go to um, Malaysia to do a film. And I was like, nah. So then, But I said to Christina, my partner, I said, what do you think? We could go to Asia for three months. And she went, well, why not? And we, so I wrote back going, you know, and we started negotiating. And then within a week, I was going to Asia. But I, uh, this, I don't know why something in it made me think you know what why not it wasn't the travel necessarily because i just come i was we were actually planning to go on holiday to venice for the for a week and then we decided not to and we went to asia instead but the hunch thing i think is a little bit like you have to rely on your intuition a little bit that there's something yeah. is going to be worth doing and if you know you can always leave it's not great obviously you can always say look i'm sorry this is not for me and it was that was one of the hardest films i've done actually but it, i'm glad i did it for the end result but it it's that thing of I don't know, just, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? It's like you're on holiday and you're walking down the street and you go, hey, why don't we just go down there? And there's something that draws you to it. And I think that's worth following sometimes, you know. Yeah. It shouldn't always be about money or celebrities or whatever, because the smallest films actually sometimes, the ones that least expecting, I think, can be the most rewarding, you know. Yeah. And I think it, you have to lay your table out and know what you're getting into. Obviously, you could get into real trouble, but, you know, it's, uh, it's it, adds, it adds the spice of the adventure for sure. Yeah. Do you guys get that thing where you're reading a script and... I mean, as a DP, I always, you know, read a script and I'm like, you know, you envision it, don't you? Do you get that with the lighting side of things as well? I mean, I'm always thinking the lighting, the camera and other stuff. Are you you always going, oh, I can, I think thinking about, oh, I can maybe do this, do that, you know. Does that kind of get you excited when you're reading a script, you know? But but I think, sorry, I think that's what it's about is that everybody brings to the table their vision of something and somehow they make, you know, unless you have very, somebody who has an incredibly strong vision and goes, I just want it like this. But I think you all, you know, sometimes you spend hours working on something and then the director just goes, I don't like it or we're not doing it. And you kind of go, Ugh. but yes, you build up this kind of construction in your head about how things are going to be according to the script. And then you imagine, you know, the actors maybe and you know how it's going to fit together. And that's quite an interesting mm. thing. But it, it's it's a yeah, it's a weird kind of uh, sculpture, I guess, that you do in your head. But then it could all be totally wrong as well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think, guess I think some of the some of the times it's um, it's nice to first of all read a script, go through a script, and, and just read it for what it is, and then you know it's the second time round you start to pitch a little, you make notes on a script, you know, although mm. a lot of them are digital now, and I yeah. fight very hard to get a paper script that I can read and scribble yeah. little notes yeah, and maybe little diagrams and yeah. you know little boxes, and it, the script is a load of a, a mess by the time I've finished with it, but. 
that it's that little those moments where you're starting to create a little bit of a picture and then you pick up the phone ring the dp and say what about this have you actually seen that this is you know this is a, a night scene and but we've got interactive light we've got this that and they'll have their ideas and before you know it you're batting ideas off between you and the dp and um mm. i find that quite fascinating that you, you're already part of such a big thing i mean Unfortunately, some of the movies I work on don't have scripts anymore. Well, this is the thing. I don't but, understand uh, how that works when somebody says, oh, we don't have a script. I'm like, but yeah. does that mean, and I, I just go, really? Yeah, that no, just actually, means it, plan, let me tell you, that just means it doesn't work. Full stop. Exactly, you hit the nail yeah. on the head. I know. Yeah. It's, hard, it's, hard you, it's like saying we're going somewhere. You go, well, have you got a plan? Have you got a ticket? Have you got anything? And no, we're just going to go. And you're like, okay. <laughs> See how far yeah, that is. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's improbable. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, you get you get trip fed the the broad strokes and then you try and pick everyone's brains and get a little yeah, bit of information no, here and not. there. And before you know it, you're getting the picture, but, um, yeah, it's certainly harder and it's, uh, it doesn't make it that financially viable because you, you can't budget and you can't, well, exactly. you know, you, you're covering it's yourself so much and you're, you what you do is you, cost of that. yeah, oh, you yeah. really find yourself covering, you know, and every department will not only, order the equipment they think they need but they cover yeah, themselves for the you know uneventualities and and, and yeah. that's how you do it you just protect yourself but also ultimately you're protecting the dp in case something happens and you've got the equipment and then you're protecting the production from silly mistakes that could come along so i, th I don't think it's but i, I also it, if somebody says i don't have a script i kind of go i don't know if i trust the fact that it's going to be a good thing to do <laughs> you know it's like it's like we're going to go on maneuvers in the army and you go well have you got a map and you go no just go that way and you're like okay yeah. see yeah. you there hopefully you know, yeah. well unfortunately if you do that you're going to lose a few along the way aren't well you? exactly That's the way it's yeah. going to yeah. go exactly. and you do natural, you, you know? do but absolutely they just go oh, yeah. touch it yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult it's a, I don't know if I I've never done that without scripts I've never you know I understand things change and people will go well this is at least a framework but I find it weird that you'd go just it'd be fine well, you're, you go yeah. through different colours of the rainbow but, uh, how many yeah. versions of the script and then you're, yeah. you're on you know white version or you know black yeah. and then it's all oh, black the whole page twice. is black yeah no you know Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah but also you go have to go into meetings and then defend a budget as mine said and say well what do you want that for and you're like well because i don't know what we're doing yeah yeah but how do you you know it's like it's like cooking a mystery meal you don't know what you what are you the meetings I mean, the meetings are comical absolutely, absolutely. comical absolutely. yeah because nobody's you Not know believed. it's yeah yeah you're um well, you know. Maybe we should not say too much about what goes on. <laughs> uh, nah, so in, no names. In terms of no, um, you, were, you brought up technology early, and it's and I think you know, especially for camera as well. You know, it's it's a huge thing that's. Um, I think it, it baffles. It still baffles me, and I'm you know, I've sort of grown up as this change has happened. You know, being yeah. DP, but um, in terms of the lighting, you, you know, like you mentioned earlier, LEDs of really kicked off, you know, the sky panels and the stairs and things like that, you know, um, yep. how I know, um, a lot, some DPs like to just use tungsten still, yep. um, which is obviously quite a uneco friendly way of shooting, but that's the way it's always been done. Um, but you know, how, yep. what aspect does it now bring to the table when being, when being asked to light a scene with the DP? You know, how has that LED technology changed for me, um, the way for me, it just It's just another thing. It's a bit like, I don't know, it's like doing anything. If you, it, you know, it's like before they had indicators on cars, you'd have to stick your hand out. So now you just push a button. It's surely that's sure. easier and yeah, it yeah. saves you time to pay attention to the driving. Yeah, you don't have so to gel. Not, you, you, can't, yeah. you can't, I wouldn't try and pretend that a, uh, an LED light is a tungsten light because it isn't. So you, should, you yeah. never make that mistake. Just use it as a, as a tool or a weapon that you need. And it, it can save you a lot of time and stress, you know. We just did a film with 500 sky panels and going from day to night. We just, it's three seconds, not yeah. two days. It's like, and the amount of gel and time and energy and money and, you know, it's like, so really it's a trade off. You go, well, I, you know, if, if you want really good chocolate, you buy really good chocolate, but if you can't afford it, buy something that's not so good. And you just, you know, you just go, well, it's not as good, but I didn't pay as much. And I, I got and it. You can grade it a bit better. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, well, in a way, yeah. but what I think the mistake is made, is where you go. It's all LED. No, it shouldn't be. It's like you yeah. should you should have all those tools ready for you, and you use one because it's. If you can get a light that does three things instead of one, and you can buy into it, if you see what I mean, then then go for it because you can do you can make yourself more efficient. 
but don't try and disguise do you know what I mean? I never really believed HMIs when I first started using them. I always like tungsten because there's a slightly synthetic taste to them, whereas tungsten feels real. And 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 HMI always feels like it's pretending to be a tungsten by color correction, etc., etc. But you get more punch. It's a quicker yeah. light. It's yeah. an easier light. So, yeah, of course. And you have to you buy you have to either you get used to it and your taste buds change, and or you know some people do only exclusively use tungsten but it's that's a hell of an undertaking mm. as martin knows from you know shooting gels and wendy's and you know it's yeah. like it's a massive thing and you we don't know producers just go we don't have time a lot of the time and money to do that or space and mm. you know it's a, so you have to be wise about it i think and I, I think they're great things but not let's not let's not be exclusive to anything let's, let's use whatever we can when we can for what we need it to be and, and enjoy that you know yeah Definitely. Yeah, um, I think there's there's tools for every sort of yeah. every aspect of filming. It, it you know it does fascinate me that some people still don't want to embrace new technology. Maybe yeah. you know the, without doubt a tungsten light is is a, is a beautiful you know beautiful light. It's it's going to give you the best color of any light. But LEDs get very close now. I think. Mm. Um, if you don't embrace it, if you don't embrace more importantly the environmental side and and and, and start protecting, um, you know, we 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 have generators um, just guzzling diesel to run these some of these stages, and it's just not right. It's it's no, it's time to change. It's time to embrace, you know, some of the higher quality LED lights. You know, your your cream sources and things like that. Your sky panels. I think now the technology's there. It's how you use that light and how you then shape it, diffuse it, get it to a better quality because the stuff that comes out the front does sometimes need a bit of taming. Yes, um, absolutely. And and you can then you can really get a, a decent quality, you know, LED with a great color spectrum and a you know diffused to the right. You know, they've even got um, the new Cineo lights. We're, we're going to start replacing some of the bigger source, single source 12Ks and things like that with the new Cineos, with the new bulbs, that single source LED bulbs. And I think now's the time, you know, maybe it wasn't five years ago with some of the, the cheaper LED quality lights, but, you know, with people like Cream Source developing all these amazing lights and Cineo with their big single source LED technology now, yeah, liquid was, cooled bulbs, and you know, flood and spot from the lighting desk. It's, it's just a fascinating time to be part of it, yeah. and I think it's time to really embrace it. Time to have a, an environmental, you know, consciousness, and time to um, adapt and, and start using it as a whole. I think the yeah. days of burning diesel have to go. I really do. Yeah, absolutely. Eighty percent of that energy is going straight up. You know, it's not going yeah. out of light at all. And also, I, I was on a set on Artemis Fell, and we, I walked past the set, and there was just happened to be a lamp, an LED lamp left on. And I, I, look, I was like, is that daylight? I couldn't work out whether it was daylight or where it was coming from. And I looked at it, and it was an LED. And I was like, oh, you know, that my mind wasn't going, is that, you know, I wasn't looking to look for a light. It just happened yeah. to glance at it. And I was, I, it was intriguing that, you know, your, 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 your taste buds change. It's like you start your palate changes and your ideas of what light size that, if you open yourself to those things and it was actually a sumo light and I was just looking and it, and it's that thing of LED light being projected is really important that we don't, you can't really get, as you said, Cineo and people like that are bringing it out. It's getting there, but it's, it's always, it's more about color temperature and CRI than the punch of light. And it's just having those weapons, you know, you don't, you'll never use it. Well, not yet. We'll be able to use a, an LED instead of an 18 K it will get there eventually, but it's, you know, you, so why, why throw that tool out of your box keep it all and, and use it all it's just you know it's a it's just just i guess sometimes just justifying how many things you have in your toolbox and mm. do you need to carry it all etc cetera, etc cetera. So, yeah and the thing that's half the problem now we're carrying in addition to the tungsten in addition to the hmi we're yeah. now carrying such a broad spectrum of yes. led lighting and um yeah. it, it's getting a bit complicated now yeah and expensive um, as well. Yeah. You know, you're not reducing any rigging. You've still got to have the same distribution network. Yep. You've still got to have the same, you know, control networks. Yep. And yep. indeed, it's it's almost getting bigger and, and more complicated. And I don't yep. think anyone really saw it going that way. But, no. you know, you, with all these different technologies, we're all having to keep up to date. We're all having to do courses. And yep. it's become a little bit of a minefield, although 
I think once the bigger source lights are there and we can embrace them and start using them and, yes. and be happy with them, because we, uh, admittedly, you know, you can't replace an 18K yet. You can't replace a 9K, but we're getting close. Some of the yeah. technology is getting real close oh, yeah, very much and right. exciting yeah. to see it, you know, but it's very early days. And once that's there, I think, you know, maybe we can start reducing some of the equipment and, and carry, you know, more to, leaning towards the LED side. And um, yeah. I know a lot of films are lit LED now, and um, they're, they're, they're damn decent movies. You know, a lot of Absolutely. people wouldn't be able to tell the difference. I, I, also, you you know, you can't bring a, you know, to, to, to take a tungsten light down to 3% is, you know, it's like, you might as well just, what's the point? You know, and you can't, you know, we, on the last movie, we were running stuff at such low levels. It was incredible, and I love it, actually, and folks probably doesn't, but you just go, that's the control you have is point zero yeah. percentages it's not you know it's half a percent and things like that. that's that's quite amazing whereas you know how could you ever do that before with an hmi or even for essence you just end up yeah. Yeah. shuttering stuff down and there's nothing yeah. coming out I and i think I the like subtlety yeah. the subtlety of lighting is becoming much better you know but uh, mm. yeah i mean fluorescent are the things that seem to be the ones that are going to fall away whether they become the new you know vintage look the retro look Getting they're retrofitting them, aren't they? They're, yeah. you know, the keynotes, they're yeah, getting yeah. the LED ones in the same housing. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. No, yeah. what I mean is that people go, hey, I want that, you know, turn of the century look. And you go, what one? <laughs> you go, well, we had everybody was doing lit by Kinoflow, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Right, there it is. But um, it's like, you know, that it's it's funny how lights come back into fashion, you know, when people didn't want it, they didn't want to use. Uh, Dinos and Wendy's and stuff like that because they were old and clunky and it was all the new thing. And then that's now become like, you know, anamorphics become the thing again. Everybody wants to use the old lenses and stuff like that. And everything, everything will come back. So it's not worth throwing anything out of the box, really. Just keep yeah. it all handy. I think we'll, the um, problem is. Sorry, I, th I think we'll just we'll, we'll jump ahead because we've, we've reached an hour now and we don't want to oh, wow. bore people <laughs> senseless carrying on chatting away. But um, what's. What is your, I mean, as we're on the, the lights themselves, um, Julian, what's your, you know, past and, you know, present, what is your favourite bit of lighting kit um, that you find is sort of, you have a little, I don't know, it's nuance for you, it's something that you really like using and... Um, I you like find it T24, actually, that's my, my and a Parkan would be one of my favourites. Yeah. Uh, a nice Parkan spot that? bulb, only because they're cheap and cheerful and they're, you know, but they're incredibly good. And a T twenty four uh, Fresnel um, tungsten lamp is just gorgeous. Uh, mole beams as well, I like very much. But I'm getting into the the LED ones. I do I do like the sky panels and the uh, you know stairs. I love very much. I think they're great. You know, that's just so in the last movie yeah. we used stairs everywhere. You could you know we're filming in stately homes where you can't get wires through doors and you yeah. have a you can just put lights around and it, you don't have any cable and it's fantastic. That's just that to me it was like this and a lot of DOPs just like that's incredible. You can just move so no it's not even about speed, just efficiently you go, oh, what about that there? And you go, okay, we'll have to run through cables through the other door. Oh, don't worry about it. You just move it. Yeah. And you just change the volume colour. I mean there's nothing that's incredible. When yeah. I first when we first started out, that would think that would blow your mind. You'd be like, "What?" You know, and uh, and that. So yeah, between those two, the T24 and the Stara, yeah. I, and uh, I mentioned Sumo Light. I think they're fantastic. They're, they're one of the few lensed LEDs which I really believe are, have a credibility about them. I haven't used a Cineo and different things yet, but this, the, those kind of because my problem with LED lights is it always tends to be soft light, and I miss that aggressive sure. light that's kind of screwed in. You know, so yeah. that's where the T24 yeah. comes in. Those Asteras are so uh, so soft as well, and I, I recently just bunched a load together because uh, yeah. we 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 needed to offset the entire room to like minus six green or something crazy because the yes. practicals are really green fluorescents, but we yes. couldn't change them because yes. um, yes. they're very really old specific ones. So we needed that all the instead of gelling all the lights, we just used mainly Asteras, so then we could yes. put minus green into them. You know, and it was just yeah. like click of a finger yeah. or by, you know, yeah. pretty much by eye as well. You know, we just, yeah. we, we did that. And that's, they are very cool. And I think, yeah. and I think, you know, again, it's the, it's the using it wisely, but it's not using it everywhere. Don't just rely on it wholeheartedly, but keep it in your, keep one in your pocket just so you can just chuck yeah. it. You know, it's kind of a, it's like the dressing on the, it's like, there you go, voila, and, and not having to make a big deal out of it. And it just gives you, gives you so much flexibility. You know, you can screw them into walls, hide them behind things. Yeah. 
I don't know. It seems like a no-brainer to me. Yeah, mm. Martin. What about you? What's um, what's your bit of kit that you could don't leave home without? <laughs> um, I mean, there's many. I mean, uh, around camera, you always want to have something ready to pop up. I, I, I really quite like the Hudson Spiders. Um, mm. As I said before, I love the cream sauce. I love the little uh, micro colors now, RGBWs, and that you can just throw them in, little chime mirrors, all these new snap grids that are designed, you know, just to clip on. Battery on the back, very speedy. You can use it as a hard or a soft light. They're so adaptable. Um, but I also really um, like having something like a little Aladdin in the hand or in the back pocket at all times in case you need a little eye pinger or just to bounce into something or give a little feel here and there if you need it. Yeah. But um, I, I do very much love the new LED technologies. I mean, I really like rigging uh, some automated lights on any set, just so you can just spin it around from the floor off the iPad, give a little hard edge or even a soft bounce into something just to give a bit of feel. Um, yeah. You know, the Ghibli's are good, the Arten, because they're – liquid cooled they're silent they really run quiet the sound department love them we used to use yeah. the blades bfml blades they were fantastic lights you can shut shutter them in off the ipad into the smallest detail and just hold a bit of card and bounce something or just a little back edge or a little detail in the corner i just find all that fascinating the older technology i mean you know i i I have to say it, I learned to love Wendy lights um, on uh, Mission Impossible Fallout, working with Rob Hardy. It, it, he uses uh, any tungsten, doesn't he? It's all he wants to use is tungsten. And, and, and <laughs> indeed, you know, early on in, in the, the meetings, we chatted about that and the speed of it and how we were going to keep up. Because with that comes huge uh, distribution and generation. And um, I'm so glad we did. Absolutely so glad we did. And we did keep up, and, you know, it was a huge rigging crew but the way we use those lights you know and the, and the the you know you can use them as long throw broad stroke lights or you can bring them in close and quadruple diffuse them and and just get the most beautiful lights i think the only problem i really had with them that rob didn't particularly care about was the noise when you start dimming uh, a fixture like that the bulbs come to life and they're so noisy mm. um but that wasn't one of his concerns so no the DPs don't Many really different care about technologies. I love an Astera, <laughs> pop an Astera in here or there. But mainly we call them hand grenades. We keep them in our hands, little Aladdin eye lights, you know, or uh, an A light just to have around. Everyone should have one in their back pocket ready to go. I think they're fantastic. Bi color, brilliant. Yeah. I got one of the new uh, versions, not Aladdin, but a different brand. And they do like just every color, as well as like police siren and everything. And they're just that size. Yeah. So you know, exactly if that. you're in a I've car and you need yeah. a, yeah, yeah. You just an you know, light or something, <laughs> it's mad. Brilliant. Yeah. Right, put it on I the roof and put the blues on. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if you want a really good linear control of light and, and color temperature and, and color mixes, you know, I, I really think the latest, you know, which probably will outdo the sky panels is the cream sauce units. I mean, their technology is superseding now, and I think um, are they the ones mainly used overhead uh, in studios and stuff? They could they... be used anywhere. They could right. be used as as equal replacements for a soft fixture. They've got harder fixtures now that I'm starting to look at, but um, they're harder to get in the UK, unfortunately. So yeah. maybe it's a yeah. while off. But no, you funny. know, I think something like um, you know the little cream sauce uh, we call them biscuits, but they're um, micro colors you know I've, I've i've got a couple of them that i bought they're fantastic lights they really are have you guys used those uh, lights that they used a lot on um that greg fraser used on star wars and yeah sputniks sputniks yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Have, yeah you never yeah, see them yeah. in the uk much do you no they're not many people have them but they're yeah. abusing yeah they're good yeah. yeah and you bunch them together and they're projectional and all soft well they're very very powerful lights i mean unfortunately for us we used them we done the second unit uh, with Greg, we were on Rogue One, and there was a lot of complications and problems with the lights and the color once they were, and you had to have the same packs, the drivers for them with the same heads, and it became a bit of a faff, and it was early days for them, and mm. maybe I didn't give them a fair opportunity, but um, I didn't like them, I have to say, I didn't like them, I couldn't see the point in using them at the time, I didn't like the colors, we could never get one to match the other. And when the guys came over, and I tried to explain that to the guys that came over, uh, they didn't want to know. 
And at that point, I thought, well, that's probably the last time I'll ever use these lights. You know, <laughs> it put me off. <laughs> I've, and, never, um, I've never had a problem with them, I must admit. Yeah, yeah. Not, so it was early days. Right and now, unfortunately. I'm sure now they're flying out the door. I mean, hopefully they are. I don't want to see anyone. And if somebody like Greg Fraser's using them, then look, let's be honest, it's he's the LED He's the LED yeah, yeah, guru, yeah. isn't he? So he's not yeah. going to use something of any inferior quality. So, yeah. you know, I, I put my hands up. I was probably quite wrong. But at the time, I um, I didn't like the attitude. So, you know, yeah. I like people to be open and let's all chat about it. And it, it didn't seem one the case light, at the one time. Light, uh, I think one light they should get a shout out is the Dado 150, actually. I think that's Yeah. Right. Is a, a trustworthy implement of a great tool. Yeah, great unsung language. hero. What a great yeah. guy. Yeah, well. yeah, never lose one of those. <laughs> Keep one of those in your back pocket. Well, you yeah. know, equally to the, the the dado, you know, always on the set floor, not far behind us, we'll have a source for. Yeah. You know, yeah. equally yeah. like you can do with the moving lights. It's the old way of doing it with a source for a decent lens on it. The shutters. Yeah, yeah, like you can use course. that. Such a variety of have different. You, have you um, used the LED lighting. one yet? Is I haven't. Yeah, I did get have pin sharp. Uh, I've tried it. It's like it's like a laser beam, you know, like yeah. scanning a room. That's how thin you yeah. can get the line. It's amazing. Yeah, I used we one had on a commercial, and it was uh, yeah. for uh, I can't say actually because it's a, I was sworn to secrecy. But anyway, I used it. And it was quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, they're very. I have very interesting. Yeah, they're heavy. That's the only thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do they have a fan built into them, Julian? Are they noisy? No. Or? Uh, no, no, they weren't. We again, we weren't shooting sound. That wasn't become a problem. I don't think I do actually. No, mm. they're good. I mean, it's just a tra traditional housing with an LED back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. really, I mean, so I mean, I only ever played with it on on the commercial, and uh, we ended up not having time to use it, <laughs> which was yeah. A shame. Well, that's always the yeah. yeah. That was the problem, um, isn't it? All right. Well, I guess we probably should wrap it up now. Um, one Bear last time. question. Yeah. Uh, any advice to give to any? budding DOPs and gaffers and how they can well, sparks when it's become a gaffer with their lighting yeah Some, something to improve the lighting yeah uh, rather yeah. than career advice I think would go towards a what's tip, your tip, uh, tip on, on lighting tip, yeah uh, lighting. tip of the day Julian do you know what I, it's funny, I asked Julian, a gaffer that years ago I was, sing, I, was sing, I was singing a BSC thing at dinner and I asked the gaffer next to us have you got any you know uh, <laughs> the season well season gaffer he said keep the money up and I was like oh I thought you were going to say something about never use soft light. Anyway, but, uh, I was that was thinking, my answer. Just get yeah, get done. the money up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. Just uh, yeah, keep your eyes open, really, and, and never stop thinking. I don't know. There's no you know every every day is different, and every, every job just is just be yeah. just be be strong, be brave. You know, it's only it's only a film. Yeah, you, yeah. You'll get sure. some other job. I don't know. I just I think we all get fixated too much on certain things, and and. You need just to. My thing is to see the bigger picture and be step back a little bit and have a look around you and just and 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 I think Martin's thing is right. It's just include everybody in it and that's really important. I think we all can all be guilty of of you know not wanting to show each other our work and I think sometimes it's just be be open and and things will come to you and and, and keep your eyes open more than else and keep your ears open because a lot of stuff will be said around you that if you don't pay attention to can be quite not damaging but can leave you out of the loop and i think that's quite important mm. yeah martin any last words of advice for me yeah i think um equally keep your ears open but try and keep your mouth shut as well i think it's really <laughs> yeah. important. i've been I told, told that, that because <laughs> you know on any film set there's too many chiefs sometimes there's too many yeah. opinions it's almost yeah. better to just ride with one opinion as long as it's safe I always say it's not necessarily wrong. There's many ways of rigging, many ways of lighting. Yep. They're not yeah. right, they're not wrong. You know, yeah. light no, bounces no, no, around no. in many different areas and um, just keep get, get your own style. Take all the different styles of any cinematographers you like and gaffers you've worked with and build your own little palette and start painting yeah, with it. I don't think there's a right or a wrong. Safety is paramount. It always will be. Work yeah. as a team player and... Um, and try and create your own little um, your own little style. I think that's fantastic. Mm. And um, you know, as you're learning, just keep your eyes peeled. There's plenty to yeah. see and plenty to learn. And, yeah. um, and, and yeah. sorry to interrupt you. I think also that less is more thing. Just keep refining things and get rid of stuff. You don't need to take everything. You don't need have a bit more uh, confidence in yourself that you don't need. To, you know, you can. You'll be fine without certain things. You know, and that's yeah. part of the experience. I think. I think that's quite right. Be bold. Let's have some bold lighting now. Let's have some yeah. really stylistic, you yeah. know, lighting. Yeah. Let's not go all soft. 
It started yeah. to go soft, it seems, very much about so. eight years ago, and we were just soft light and everything. Let's get yeah. old again. Let's have yeah, some yeah. vision. Let's go. Yeah, what do you call it? Cinematic quality. Let's go yeah, for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. More. Couldn't agree more. Well, um, well, thank you very just much. Just yeah. wash your hands. That's all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the new one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully we'll all be on set soon enough. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Julian. No problem. And, thank you. Uh, yes, thanks, James. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And, uh, Cheers, guys. We'll, thank we'll you. see you next week Good where night. we have uh, Matthew Le Boutique, the uh, DP who shot Swan, the wrestler, Iron Man, and many, many more. So we look forward to that. We we'll see you then. You want to get his? You want to get his gaffer on, Mike, as well. Mike Bellman, to come on with we'll, you. We'll try and sure. get him yeah, on as well. Go. I'll, I'll, I'll let's send him an email. I'll yeah. let you know. Right. On a Saturday. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, guys. Bye. Take care. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night, guys. Bye. Bye.